Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. While we are uh, thrilled to have Haley Morris Cafiero here, all the way from Memphis. Um, Haley holds a BA in Photography and a BFA in Ceramics from University of North Florida and an MFA in Art from University of Arizona. Currently, she works as an associate professor at Memphis College of Art. Her series of photographs, Weight Watcher, Watchers, has been the subject of numerous feature articles, and Haley has appeared on CBS This Morning and Huffington Post Live to discuss her photographs. She was a nominee for the 2014 Pre-Pictet and a finalist for the Renaissance Prize in Pre-Virginia. Her Image Blondie is a semi-finalist for the Outwin Bushever Portrait Prize. Recent exhibitions include New Space Center for Photography and the Format Photography Festival, as well as Mount Rocco Photo Festival in Kobe, Japan. Her first monograph, The Watchers, has just been published by the Magenta Foundation. Congratulations. So please help me welcome Haley Morris Cafiero to our lecture series. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the Masters in Digital Photography program for hosting me. And I want to thank Tom for making it happen and Jaime for making it like easy <laughs> to happen. Um, but I'm just thrilled to be here and I thank you so much for coming. And when I thought about what I was going to speak to you tonight, um, I thought about how can I communicate what's going on in my head a little bit more than what you would see just from looking at the images or reading about the stories online. So I kind of wanted to give you a, kind of a step back into what I, what I did when I was in graduate school, just to give you a, a little look into my um, process. And so when, um, when, I, when I work or when I ever, whenever I create, I, whatever I'm working with, whether it's photography or ceramics, although it's been photography for many years, uh, it's a tool. It's a tool to communicate what I'm, what I'm thinking and what I'm trying to say. And the same goes for my body. And whether it was work that I did that had to do about my physical body or my internal body, um, it, it's, it's a tool. So just to kind of give you a, an idea that um, for, for me, they, there are self-portraits, but to me, it's, I'm, just a, I'm just a tool like anything else uh, that I would use to create the image. And then, so in grad school, I started thinking about uh, my body as an object, and an, an object that I could not control. Um, physically, with um, weight, and losing weight, and gaining weight, and the inability to lose weight, and then more internally with the lack of uh, ability to control diseases. At the time, all of my family were, were dying of cancer. And so this idea of having a, a shell that hides things that are happening beneath was really interesting. But what kind of started me on the path where I am now is the idea of the physical body. And I really, was inspired by Eleanor Anton's uh, carving a traditional sculpture where she lost 10 pounds over uh, 37 days and the idea about trying to uh, shape her body and get rid of excess much like a Greek sculptor shaves away marble was really really interesting to me because it was activating the viewer or the, or the public using something that's easy to work with, which is the body, meaning it's real simple, it's always here, I don't have to schedule. And so that's when I started to f realize that performance artists of, you know, the early feminist performance artists were so inspirational to my work, okay? So next we've got Adrienne Piper and her mythic being, and at the time, when I started Weight Watchers, I didn't think about this at all, but I'm just kind of giving you my, my best friends, my girlfriends, when I'm thinking about anything that I'm creating. And um, the idea of um, dressing up, um, going into public, uh, getting public reaction, 
just basically using yourself as a control of an experiment and inserting yourself into the public to see what happens really interested me because it, it's, uh, to me, that's the real experience and the photograph or the video was the document of that experience. So, um, and then it was much later that Lori Anderson, I don't know why I didn't, like I seemed looking back and getting this presentation together, I was like, man, I really liked 1972 and 73 and 74. I don't know, you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, I was going to be a lawyer um, when I went to school. Uh, all my life I was going to be a lawyer, and when I went to undergrad, I worked for lawyers, and it was the most boring thing. Sorry, lawyers. Um, sorry. But, um, and so I just wanted to do something that would affect society. I wanted to, you know, you, you watch the TV and you see the lawyers find the lost piece of evidence that saves someone's life. Well, I worked at a law firm where you fill out forms. So it, it was not equivalent. So when you're, when, you're, when you're able to affect change in a different way was incredibly exciting for me, and that's how I got into art. And so when Lori Anderson, um, fully automated Nikon object, objectation, objection, objectivity, um, photographed men who catcalled her. Um, and again, this was not, this was completely off my radar until more recently, I know. Um, but th that idea of public and gaze and how the gaze is, you know, how we, you know, even though she's uh, marking out the eyes, we've still captured, or she's still captured, the people who have catcalled her, okay? And then probably the most influence, see I always, the most influential piece for me is Janine Antoni's uh, Loving Care. And the idea of taking your hair and dipping it in uh, hair dye and mopping the gallery floor with it, to me, just, you know, the idea of watching someone mop the f gallery floor with hair color and hair like a mop. And how could you not, how could you not act? How could you not move? And every time I see this piece, like I can, I feel like the follicles in my hair are being dipped into that bucket and moving on the floor. And so when I want to be inspired, when I want to go out and get something done, I love photography. I love it. I'm surrounded by it every day. But what gets me moving are the performance artists because that's, you know, it tickles my hair follicles, it makes my, my fingers jumpy, it, it, you know, makes my spine tingly, much, much, much more, and that's what gets me moving physically. Um, and, and Jenny Seville was an influence, but really this painting, and it was really because Plan had uh, the topography of the body and the mass of the body um, in a way that I had never seen before. Um, just taking a body and drawing it out, drawing out where um, plastic surgery might happen, but also topographical maps, like mass and size and expanse. And that that just kind of, this was my thesis, <laughs> like this is my MFA thesis paper, um, where these artists and really trying to work whatever they made me feel, like I wanna make my viewer feel. So there's the foundation. And when I was um, in graduate school, I wanted to, again, um, activate the public, do work in the public. Um, and so, I found a public, well, it found me first, uh, a public bathroom that is built to spec where everyone should be able to fit into the public bathroom stall and use the bathroom. And I couldn't fit into it. And so, and I'm sure a lot of people couldn't fit into it, but I'm the one that's gonna set up a camera and I'm gonna, what I did was I tried to lose weight for, I ended up like dieting for 10 weeks, but I wanted to lose weight every week to try to uh, fit into this bathroom stall. So I would take a picture of me trying to fit into the bathroom stall and I would record my weight. And what you see here are seven daguerreotypes in rawhide boxes 
on the left is the image and on the right is the amount of weight I lost that week in paraffin wax. Paraffin wax is about beauty. I wanted rawhide because that skin, you know, you could see the veining in the skin, but also when the light hit, um, it's transparent enough that when the light hit the wax, it would glow. And oftentimes when I see a project, something I want to work on, I, I actually see its finished form. And then I work backwards because that's, I saw the piece and knew that I wanted to work with this bathroom. And then that's what happened. And so um, each one was a daguerreotype. And I chose a daguerreotype because it was really important that it's a mirror, not like a liquid light mirror, but a, a daguerreotype's polished uh, silver on copper and it's a mirror finish. And you basically change the property of that silver using chemicals. So the image comes off, can, like, comes out of the plate, comes off of the surface instead of liquid light that would just sit on top. And also going back to this idea of the history of portraiture and daguerreotypes, this is, this is a portrait of me trying to fit into the bathroom, but this is probably not what Daguerre would like to photograph, you know, when he was doing these in, you know, the 1800s. So this, this kind of shirking the history of portraiture a little bit. And then also the mirror would allow the viewer to see themselves in my image trying to fit. You could, if you took a step to the left, you could see the wax. And then on the pedestal, you could see, I had it lit so you could see an image. On the image on the on the pedestal, and um, the idea of these kind of quirky boxes that um, misshape and some of the wax was just a splash of wax because I didn't lose a lot of weight that week. Some of the wax is overflowing and some of the wax is like spilling out because I lost a lot of weight that week. Um, but at the time, I didn't know what you start the project, you have no idea what it's going to look like in the end, because I have no idea how much weight I'm going to lose. So flash forward a few years, and again, I'm thinking about my body, but I want to think about it in a different way that I had before. And so I started working on a series of self-portraits called Something to Weigh, where I would photograph myself in places where I ever think about my weight, which is not often. Um, social situations. You always go out for a bite to eat. If you're at the pool, there's a bikini involved. Um, so I carry my camera around with me constantly. And whenever I saw a location um, that was beautifully lit, barren <laughs> most of the time, I would set up a camera and just photograph it. And they're very open-ended. Some, you know, people saw them as uh, optimistic. Some saw them as pessimistic. It's all okay. Yes, I agree with you all. Um, but it was really just about me and, and space at the time. And picking areas where there were, uh, you know, food is constantly around. Food presentation is actually a... a, a uh, a degree and a career of how to present food and when you sometimes when I would order food people look at me like um are you sure you want that you, and the Paula Dean buffet um, before it closed down Paula um, it's it looked just like a, uh, a bakery it looked just like a grocery store it looked just like it was presenting food in mass quantities that would make you feel comfortable to eat it. So, of course, I had to spend some time in the Paula Deen uh, buffet. And, uh, again, just these were whenever a, a time would appear, I would take a picture. These were not planned. So comparing my body, my, my, the size of my leg to my friend's two legs and then this little random kid swam by like a shark. Um, just, just trying out things and investigating. But it was when I was shooting one of those in Times Square on the Coca-Cola steps in 2010 that I got the first image for the series. And 
uh, this is shot with film, rangefinder, tripod, and again, it was just supposed to be about me in, in the space, surrounded by, you know, Hershey's advertising. But when I got the film back, and it, I remember <laughs> taking a while to get the film back, um, I noticed this guy and, uh, you know, fixated on me, even though he's being photographed by a woman. And the sensory capital of the world, overload capital of the world, and I, I remember them, but I didn't, I mean, I just remember seeing them, but I don't, I didn't interact with them in any way. And then I got an image on the same roll five minutes later. So I thought about what happens if I set up a camera in public and just do everyday things and let's see what happens. So for the past five years, that's what I've been doing. And so what I do is I travel and I carry a camera with me everywhere. And typically when I go from point A to B, if there's this location that looks really interesting, I like a lot of diagonals, I like a lot of lines. If there's any kind of um, uh, gendered uh, advertising, that's a bonus. But there's gotta be public and lots of people so uh, we'll stop, we'll set up a camera, and depending on the setup, sometimes I'm alone and I'll put a camera on a bench. Most of the time I'm with an assistant, which is uh, on often these trips uh, a student who I'll buy them dinner. Sometimes it's a stranger, I'll buy them a coffee. Um, less times it's my husband, because he's really bad at it, but because um, he's, you know, he's a, uh, quantum theoretical chemist so you know anyway <laughs> nothing else um, needs to be said but you know the the idea of um, taking a moment in time and presenting it and so when I look through the film or look through the images I pick the ones that appear to have someone who looks uh, critically or questioning of my presence just something about there's a there's a a cut of an eye, a curl of a lip, and that's the image that I choose to present. I don't know what they're thinking, um, and, but that's what it's about. It's about the gaze, how we use the gaze to communicate something, and how we interpret gaze, of the gaze, and sometimes how we even use that gaze to determine our own self-worth. And there you go. So. Um, this is chronological, just to give you an idea. I, thought, I was like, well, do I want to do it by how would I curate it? And I just decided to go chronological. But the camera's not hidden. This is, well, this is the one <coughs> hidden one because it was compositionally better from this angle. But I try to do things in these locations that fit the scene. I don't <gasps> hang around for too long at all. And... Um, I try not to stand out in any way. These are the clothes that I were, would have been wearing had I, you know, this is just me on vacation or me going to a museum or me teaching a class. This is not costume. Um, I'm trying to think of everything that everyone's ever said. No, it's not, they're not photoshopped. Because um, the thing is, is that they're not, they're not a documentary series. I don't, the truth, I don't know what the people are thinking. and. To me, it's equally valid, the conversation that they're not looking at you is equally valid as, oh my God, that guy is such a jerk. I just stand back and I start the conversation. That's what I want to do. So um, this image is the m probably the most well-known and uh, it's on a tripod. And whether they see the camera early on, it was, um, it was, a, it was a Leica M8 um, that had a horrible crop ratio. I hope Leica's looking at this. Um, and then it moved to an SLR because I could use remotely uh, remote triggers, but people look right into the lenses of SLRs. I mean, without a doubt. And so um, it moved to film and then um, finally mirrorless um, uh, Oh my gosh, Fuji X-T1 mirrorless is what I use now. 
So back in the early stages of the project, it was a tripod. I don't know if they saw it. They might, they might have seen the camera. I don't know. I didn't ask them. But whether they know the camera's there or not, it's about that moment in time. And this moment in time, I'm talking on the phone with my mom. And again, I chose it because of the, the lines. And I, when they walked by me, I didn't know that they were there, except I smelled a super strong whiff of um, cologne. Like, no, no, like one of those mall ones, like Hollister, I don't know. Like my nieces make me buy them clothes there, the, 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 the strong one. And I thought, okay, you know, it was, it was a take me back kind of like whiff. But when I got to the computer and saw the image, um, this is the image that, um, that happened. And I'm actually just really intrigued about the moment and where putting the hat on my head, but also the guy's hand on his belly is what really interested me. And to give you another story, um, I, every year I take students to a foreign country and I set them up with portfolio reviews. And this year we went to Spain and when I got to Barcelona, I just noticed everybody was looking at everyone. Everybody was checking everyone out. And it was, it was the most I've ever seen it. And it was very noticeable. And when I was crossing the street uh, with a student, it was one of those days that felt like 115 degrees. So she had her shirt tied up and she was wearing really small shorts and she's very you know, curvy. Um, and there was two men behind us that I could see in the reflection in the, across the street. And one of them was going like this to her and one of them was going like that to me and they were calling me Gorda, which I know what that means. So um, it's fat. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, let me set up a camera. Um, it's hot, let me get some gelato and let's see what happens. And so in this case, set up a tripod across the street and trigger and this girl's actually hitting her belly. So the whole time, it's like three frames of just her hitting her belly. Um, but so it's, it's about trying to find a diverse pool of people. Because to me, it's not about one gender, one, uh, you know, t uh, one part of the world. It's just uh, an experiment across everyone. And so I've been very, very, very fortunate to be able to travel. Um, and I've noticed in my travels that the kind of the, 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 when people are in touristy areas, they, they'll speak a lot more. Like I have a lot of times people will say, oh, why are they wasting the camera to photograph her? But, you know, sometimes I have an image, sometimes I don't. So. Um, this is another story. We decided to see the Mediterranean and we walked to the Mediterranean and again, it's super hot, but there were hundreds of people packed on the sand and only like a dozen in the ocean, like supermodels and teenagers. Okay, you got the grandma bathing suit. Let me strap on a camera to someone's back, auto, uh, continuous self timer and let's see what happens. So again, it's not, it's not, I'm going to go shoot and schedule a shoot and the light is going to be at a certain angle. It's very intuitive. It's very um, happenstance. Um, Atlanta is the place that I've been, I was born in Atlanta, and it's the place I've been most visual, uh, verbally abused, but very few images, just as a side note. Um, but so a lot of the images happen in multiple frames. So. Um, as with obviously with the film cameras, it's a one shot, one frame. And some of the SLRs, there are multiple frames, but as I change to the uh, mirrorless, I've got lots of quick little images to have the little faster frames. And you know, some of them are a little bit more subtle about like how, again, don't know what they're thinking, but if two people versus one and the way that they're looking in the otherness is kind of why I picked this image. Um, I went to Peru and um, had a lot of success in Peru. Don't know why, 
but um, I'm not saying anything about the Peruvian people, but um, this idea of definitely looking different. I mean, and it's, you know, a lot of people have said that it's about the weight, but to me it's about the image, our, our identity being uh, communicated by our image. So to me it's the fact that I'm a woman, I'm blonde, I don't have super made up hair, super made up makeup, um, yeah, and I'm overweight too, it's all that. So, you know, it's just, I'm a stand-in for someone who doesn't fit into society's norms is basically the way I look at it. Um, and so throughout the project, I don't shoot often in Memphis. And I think that's because the, the home, this is in Memphis, it's one of the very few images in Memphis. Um, I, I think there's something about the, you know, for a while there when I shot in Memphis really early on, I was getting like 50 year old men like nothing but 50 year old men and I was like ah, I don't want it to be about 50 year old men so um, went to Prague again trying to find areas where people would pass through in public um, and the idea of um, just putting myself out there and see what happens and this is one of my favorite images um, from the series to be honest with you um, I don't know if he's checking me out. I don't know, but even that, you know, is is something, you know. Uh, when I went to Paris, um, again, this idea of it was beauty. Everyone was beautiful in Paris. Like everyone was beautiful in Paris. Oh my gosh, and um, and I wanted to do the shoot in Paris. And by this point when I got the, the Fuji mirrorless camera, the camera dangles from someone's neck and they're not looking in the viewfinder. And they were never looking in the viewfinder anyway because I don't want the attention of someone taking a picture. So I set up the exposure, I set up the focus, I set up everything and I have a trigger and most of the time it's the curl of a hair when I see a group of people coming, but they just hold the button down. And I actually got the Fuji so I could work it remotely with my phone, but it only takes one shot at a time which is not why I bought the camera. So anyway, that technology is not working either. But um, again, stangled from the camera, not even looking at the camera and just holding the button down. Um, about, uh, about a little over a year ago, this is, this is a point where it's gone through the media. I've gotten a lots and lots of comments that I'll talk about in a minute. And so this idea of like, what could I do? Well, I could go to the vainest cities in America. That's where I'm going to go. And I Google, you can Google vainest cities in America, Los Angeles. It was my start. And what am I going to do there? I'm going to do what they do there. And, uh, um, and on Muscle Beach is work out and stretch. So there you go. And then I wanted to present to you one where there's multiple images, because there's some where I have seven or eight images that I can choose from. But just to give you an idea, there, there are definite moments in time. And sometimes they're extractions of microseconds, but sometimes there are many seconds. Um, sometimes they're a little bit more, um, you know, they're not direct. They're, it's like almost looking through me. Um, and that's, that's really interesting to me when little things like that happen. Um, Hawaii, I got very, very lucky to go to Hawaii, um, very cheap and, um, couch surfing and Hawaii I wanted to go to because again, when I thought of Hawaii, it was bathing suits, nothing but bathing suits, nothing but beach and, and again, so activating the public in the swimsuit because um, you can't do that, like, like uh, walking around Prague in a swimsuit would look funny. So, okay. And then the second vainest place in the country is Miami. So let's see what happens when I go to Miami. So it's very, um, it's very, it's like at this point, the book is, I know the book is going to be published, concentrated, but it's like road tripping. Drive to Miami and then up to Cocoa Beach, 
And so these are all new images. Um, and actually, some of them have never been on the internet before. So um, trying to put myself in different situations. I've got a lot talking on the phone. I've got a lot in the city. What happens at the beach? What happens at the um, athletic get fit festivals that towns have? Um, this is what happens. So again, go to Target, buy the plus size workout clothes, go to the activity event, see what happens. Um, and bike week, you gotta go to bike week. Um, uh, I just remember, I remember when I went to University of North Florida, I would go to Daytona, which is like an hour away, and um, document the bikers. And the, you know, the, the women, a lot of them wear next to nothing, very leather, you know. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Bike Week and see what happens. And, you know, so that's kind of the shooting side. On the same time, um, there's this whole other layer that came out while doing the project, which is when it went on media, which it started on Lynn Scratch. And uh, Lynn Scratch is a blog run by Eileen Smithson. And, um, you know, I definitely respected it. I mean, it was, you know, but the day, this is, a, this is, another, this is another piece of advice. Check your spam folder often. Okay, and I tell everyone that, and I thought I did that, but Eileen emailed me in February and said, look, I'm just trying to put your images, you know, on Lens Scratch. Will you please respond? And I'm like, man, what am I missing? It was in my spam folder in December. So I'm like, ugh. Um, so she published it in uh, February, and the next day it was on Huffington Post. The next day it was on um, Daily Mail UK, and then that's um, like where it went viral. I hate that word, viral, but there you go. Um, but it allowed me to have, it allowed people to have access to the images that would never see them otherwise. Like people would never, who, people would never go to a gallery, people would never go to a museum, are able to see it. So along the way, it was an education and media management, <laughs> um, a really quick one, like don't say yes to everything, but you better respond or they're gonna publish it the way they want to. Um, and again, they will, you know, you, ha you have to make sure that your images are being represented the way you want them represented, because otherwise they'll write it any way they want. And then also at the same time, um, the comment section, the comment section had <coughs> thousands of critical comments. And I know we say, don't read the comment section. But I was just really like just enthralled with the comment section because it, it, they made me laugh because if people were not com uh, you know, commenting on the photographs. They were commenting on me and how ugly I am and how I would just be fine if I wore better clothes or, you know, she looks like a, a pillowcase full of doorknobs. Like, and so I started archiving these comments because this is happening while I'm shooting and this is kind of... Uh, affecting the shooting as, as I'm going. But to me, it's, it's hilarious that someone is gonna take time out of their day to make a comment about me that I don't care about. And that there's a blog, this is actually, this is actually the more recent one. There's one that came up in my Google alerts. It's like, what's this? Fatty fat ass takes picture of her fat ass and calls it art. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's, a, that's one for the wall. Then then this is the more recent one, so like there's you know, this guy, he's dedicating his blog for two days to how ugly I am and how I just need to work out. And I'm just like, okay. So uh, at the same time, I'm also receiving lots of positive emails. The emails, very few of them, you know, were negative, but mostly positive. So, uh, but to me, they were all a part of this idea of how we interact with one another, how it's all part of the project, like the images and the comments together. So when I made the book, um, that was really important for me for those comments to be throughout the narrative of the book. So the cover is really squishy and fleshy, and on the front is de uh, the text of positive comments is debossed in the front and negative comments in the back. 
negative comments throughout the liners. But, um, and then throughout the book, there's images, but as kind of moments of pause, there's um, a negative comment with where, you know, with reference, because it is actually a cited quote, and a positive comment. And so it was really uh, important to me to kind of include that into the book as well, because to me it's about, again, the idea of the gaze, how we look, how others perceive us, how, you know, I got emails from people that would say that the way someone looked at them made them want to kill themselves. And I, I, you know, when I made this project, I'm like a photographer using, you know, photography as a tool, very performance-based artist, making work, and for it to have that effect on people is, is great, you know, but that was not the goal. Um, and then, this is, this is my favorite, mm -hmm. like on my tombstone or wherever I end up, I don't want them that because I, I don't know what a pillowcase full of doorknobs <laughs> looks like I mean like where a pillowcase full of doorknobs it's like so funny but like I'm unemployed I'm um, I'm diabetic I mean all this crazy wackadoodle stuff just based on the photographs and and so that that just totally intrigued me with the internet culture and how we you know people become famous for being mean and nasty and commenting. So um, the book is on the way. It's here. It's in waiting in Tennessee, I think, um, probably in the next couple of days. So um, I think with the next um, kind of aspect of things is doing the project. And because I was like, I'm done. I'm done with the project. The book is out. I'm done. But then I went to Japan. And that was like, that was like fishing in a barrel with images. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll shoot, um, you know, in a little bit more location kind of things. Mm -hmm. But I am kind of taking the idea of the gaze and working with it with a kind of a next project. So um, I did come up with, I watched a lot of your videos and I tried to come up with some advice for people that you, you know, you know, yeah. And I thought, well, you know, all the advice that others have given you is great. But I'm like, what, what do I do that's different? And then I'm like, man, I'm a little more blunt. Okay. But know your audience. Because I think a lot of people say, oh, I know my audience. You know, that's, you know, I want everybody to see my photographs. Well, if you don't know who really is going to support the project, you ha you're taking a lot of effort and throwing your net really wide. But if you say, okay, my project, me, has to do with the body, so I could direct it more towards university galleries that have um, not just art programs, but um, you know, uh, psychology or women's studies, okay? Because otherwise, I'm taking a lot of effort and um, I could be directing it and getting a lot more um, you know, a lot more success with a lot more concentrated effort. And a lot of times artists do not like to think of themselves as a, as a brand or a package. And you can call yourself whatever you want. You can call it a widget. But whatever it is, it should, it should be organized and deliverable in a way that fits your images. Like you may love edgy, like urban outfitter design looking stuff. But if your photographs look like doilies, okay, like those do not go together, okay. Also, the word, just keep in mind whenever you see something, like I apply for more things to avoid regret than I actually think that I'm actually going to get in. I'll tell you 100%, 99% of the things, you know, 100%, let's just go for it, are, um, I don't think I have a chance, but I would rather get rejected than not do it because failure is not rejection. Failure is not trying. Because the worst they can say is no. They're not going to send you a virus with your rejection note so you can't create images anymore. Okay? They're not going to do that. Okay? Um, and then project output. When I went to Japan, this kind of hit me. I, you know, this hit me in Japan. Beautiful photograph or photographers, beautiful photographs. Wonderful 
wonderful, great, they're doing some great things in Japan. Not that I didn't think they were, but it was stunningly amazing work. And everybody I met with, all the photographers wanted a book, wanted a book, wanted a book. And I thought, well, if we all sat in a room and realized that we all want a book, we got about 100 books here. How are we going to find homes for 100 books? So, you know, I know that I wanted a book because I wanted to get the images to people who don't go to a gallery. But I think as artists, we've got to think of ways to present our images in, in other forms. Like, does it need to be a book that goes on a bookshelf, or does it need to be a specially made, one-of-a-kind object? Or does it need to be something else? Um, oh, and I forgot to say, with every rejection, I do apply for two opportunities. Actually, that's a fact. And if it's on an opportunity, it's because um, I got like six rejections in one weekend, one time. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's 12 things. But even just engaging with the outside world, like I tweeted like Margaret Cho, and now she's a fan. And, you know, so there's just little things, engagements. So every rejection, two engagements. Anyway, so go back. And then creative collection, uh, collect, create collectives with other artists and self-curate opportunities. We all want self-solo shows. We all want shows, but um, spaces, you know, galleries, nonprofit organizations are much more dependent on, on the way, um, you know, on the people that come in. And so you're going to get a lot more opportunity out of group shows. And so I'm actually grateful to be in a collective with a couple of people in the audience. And if you look at the work, it is so diverse. But we can package it and we can write a curatorial proposal that would just about suit anybody who has any interest in photography because the work is so diverse. Um, and then read the fine print. Um, I didn't get any, any money for any of the articles. And I know people are like, oh, that's a big no-no. We do not put our images unless it's, you know, we get paid. Well, um, first of all, my goal the first time was to get the images out there. Actually, the, there was no goal the first time. The first time I was just like, okay, I'll put them on there, okay. But then in November of 14, I wanted a Kickstarter funded. And now um, anything that comes out, because I don't want to say it in case it doesn't happen, um, because that's happened before. If, it, if that happens, it's to sell books. So, but read the fine print on those, because they'll give you $400 to publish your images. But anybody who ever sues them and thinks of your work, you, and the, and the agreements that I got, unless I'm, you know, that you, you're responsible for the entire bur burden of that legal action. Not worth it for $400. So um, if that's really important to you, then, then you know, just, just read the fine print is, is really my advice. Um, but that's it. Thank you for coming and thank you for being bold enough to even have that type of uh, composition in your work. And uh, I was actually wondering what's another, because this is all social commentary to me, what's another form of social commentary that you would like to approach in your work one day? Oh, that's a good question. Um, um, for me, the um, Another form of social commentary, I think I'm very, very, very addicted to image and our identity being presented through our image. And so I think for the, and I, and I, I just can't get away from it. So right now I'm actually, oh, all right, I'm working on, <laughs> it's because it's like a little baby. Like you've got this little squirrel that you've kind of brought over to you and you don't want to scare it away by telling everybody, <laughs> Saul. <laughs> But like you, like I want to take the gaze and um, try to regain it and try to, to, to really, because I've reversed the gaze back on to people. So now how can I take that gaze and kind of control it and capture it? There's a little, a little nugget, a little, little, a little nugget. Any other questions? Well, I'm, I'm curious if, um, speaking of turning the tables back on people, do you ever hear from somebody in your photographs, somebody who's actually, you know, maybe 
seen the image and regretted uh, what they did? Um, I, I mean, it's, I have, they were, you know, but it's, it's not really even about them. Um, and when you do work like this, everybody becomes a lawyer. I mean, you, you, you need legal advice and no one's around to help you, but man, you do something like this and everybody's a lawyer. So, I mean, of course I got it checked out. Of course I know what to do. Of course, you know, I'm going to take care of myself. I mean, but, you know, to me the photos are really even not about them. Like, to me, they're, they're anonymous. Like, I don't, I mean, I just, they're just, it's not about them. I was curious on the human level. I mean, let's say the two cops that are in the picture. Uh, I, I wonder how they feel if they see it in the media and they're, pub they're public people. They're out there to respect and protect and serve, mm -hmm. so. Oh, they've seen it. They've, uh, there's a formal statement at the NYPD that, that that image is photoshopped. Okay. So um, they've seen it, I assume, but I'm not interested in getting them fired. Like people have tried to like get me to tell their names. I'm not interested in any of that. Like I'm not, not interested, not about them, not, you know, and it's, um, but I, I just think it's really interesting that there's a formal statement, like somewhere there's a file about that my image is photoshopped. And I'm like, his arm is right there, people. But, you know. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Oh, um, first off, thank you very much. And as this gentleman in front of me said, it's very courageous. I remember I first saw your work on Feature Shoot, and it pretty much blew me away. And um, I have two questions. One is about what is your desired sort of consequence or um, outcome of this work, if you're thinking about sort of the work you're showing before is your, your early influences, you know, turning the camera back on the mail or reminding us of um, the, the, how misogynist culture can be. And the other question I have is, what was sort of with the mainstream media that re you're on television, you've had a lot of really great success that many of us in the room would you know, be you know, overjoyed to have, but what was the context in which your work was presented? How did the media speak about it? And, you know, talk a little bit more about um, how that all sort of played out. Okay. Um, so, um, the first question is, what is my goal with the images? Um, the goal is for the viewer to um, ask themselves a question about the gaze and their role. What would they do? And that's really it. Um, it'd be great. I mean, I think it's just a bonus for someone to say, you know, people have emailed me, you know, I used to be that person and seeing how I looked, I'm not going to be that anymore. Okay. You know that, I mean, it's great. But as an artist, it is strictly to ask the question 100% um, and let the viewer answer and they'll answer any answer. And that's, that's really the goal with the, with the images as far as my, I see it. And then the media, the mainstream media took the context of fat shaming. Um, if you Google fat shaming photographer, I show up. The yeah, first entry and the first few pages of entry, although I've never said the word fat shaming, ever, ever. Um, but I think, it, I think the idea that someone would present images of, of people without you know, blurring their face or, you know, I think that's what the media picked up on. But, you know, it, it's, and the, the, the media wanted to make me honey boo boo, like reality star, like um, lifetime movie. I, a producer emailed me and wanted to make a rom-com. Let's do a rom-com about your life. And I'm like, no, no, you have to say no. If you say yes, it's the, what is it, the, the tail wagging the dog or the, whatever it is, Say no, say no, it's art. I don't want to be honey boo boo, it's art. And that's, you know, they, they will take it and push it the way they want about sensationalism and it's not, um, I tell them no, I'd be sure and tell you, you tell them no. Because if you don't respond or if you say yes, then suddenly, yeah, you're honey boo boo and I don't want to do that. So thank you. Um, do you ever have any 
like emotional reaction or have you gone through any kind of um I guess emotional transformation through this project and if so how does that affect your work um I don't have an exciting answer um in grad school when I started working with myself as the subject it's like a chemical reaction like you have to consider yourself the other because otherwise if you hear people saying you know oh you, you got too much light on that fat roll you're like oh my god oh you know it, it was too it's too personal so really early on I shut off any any opinions about myself with images I, I don't know how I did it. I don't know if I drank some like Kool-Aid. I don't know, but it just it just had to happen. So when I see the images, um, I get excited that I get super excited that something was captured in like a microsecond. I mean, because it's really just about that moment in time, and um, really that's the <laughs> it's it's very scientific. It's very I mean, I don't ever want to be like oh my gosh why you no. Know, no. It's just exciting about capturing that gaze, whatever that gaze is. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I think it was interesting that when you start the um, talk, you identify photography as the tool. It's almost like like a medium of documentation for like a performance work. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, like the moment is so important because you choose to represent them as pictures and not really videos. Uh, it seems like you haven't really thought of like working in a video format for this project. Or have you, oh, I, or that, like maybe I just. So the question is, have I worked with video? Um, I honestly think that we get very desensitized by video. Um, and I, I think that's, I think that's like a personal thing. I mean, I love video artists and I think that's, but I think I think there's opportunities where several images, multiple images can be presented, almost like a stop motion. But for me, I think a video, I mean, because these are quick. These are like snippets, very like, you know, two, three seconds at most. Um, but I also think for me, um, video is a desensitizer to it, um, to the gaze, because I think it's, I don't know, that's, that's me. Maybe I don't want to learn Final Cut Pro, but, I don't know. It's just it's something I just, it's, it's almost, you know, of course you're going to do video. But it's, I, I just, I can't. But it's like a, also the same reason like I'm not sculpting it out of wood. Like, again, it's just not a tool that I'm not, I'm not happy with. It's not even comfortable because if I really wanted video, I'd learn it. Um, I just, I don't know. It doesn't fit. doesn't makes me do stink face when I think about it. That's kind of like the, the no-go. The answer is no. No. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, Haley, I'm, I'm a little curious. Um, you know, ma many artists have also glorified um, larger women. Mm -hmm. and you have the term Rubenesque. Irving Penn did it. And Leonard, um, Leonard Nimoy. Um, <laughs> he, he did. He did, I was yeah. thinking at the... And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what you think of, uh, of work like that. I mean, it doesn't address the gaze. It's sort of, are we uh, enjoying their gaze? Or how does that, I feel, I see a tremendous contrast, and I'm just curious. Also, I'd want to incorporate Jen Davis into that way of thinking, what you think of how the, your work fits into those, or doesn't it? You know, I, I don't think it does. Okay. I mean, I think it, I think it, I mean, obviously it does on one level and the surface, but I think from, from my point of view, it really doesn't because it's again about the performance of, of going, you know, the unperformance almost, going out and doing the mundane, doing the activity. I just happen to be um, overweight and it just so happens, you know, like, but I, I get compared a lot. Like if I had a dollar for every time someone said, have you seen Jen Davis's work? I'd be a millionaire. I mean, it would be insane how much money I'd have. And of course I saw Jen Davis's work. But I don't think, I think they're, you know, I think my earlier series had a lot more to do with Jen Davis than this. And I think it's, you know, maybe it's my robotic way of thinking. But to me, it's more really about the action and the performance than the actual image of a body. No, I think that's, I, I appreciate you um, addressing that. I have to commend you, I mean, 
that you that you don't take like the, all those comments personally. Oh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, I'm like you know one bad Facebook post, and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I th and that you included them in the books, I think, is really really um, meaningful and to the point. Well, so I, I think I it's great. Honestly, when that fatty fat ass thing came on, I laughed my tail off. I laughed so hard. And I showed a friend, and he got so upset. I'm like, why are you upset? This is ridiculous. Like, I mean, you know, it's like I'm just a little person, and I don't mean anything, but this guy's like dedicating his, his blog. He makes money off that. And then these people are saying all these horrible things because it's cool. And what I thought was interesting about that one is I posted it to Facebook one day. I was like, this is just funny. Just, this is just funny. And my friends just inundated him with comments like, you're a jerk, you're this, you're that, and he deleted them all. And so, I mean, that's totally not what he's interested in, you know, I mean, and so, I mean, this, the idea of, you know, I'm interested in, and again, the question about social practice, I'm interested, another idea I have is lifting the veil of anonymity around internet culture and email culture. I get, you know, I think I'm going to start with a guy that, you know, is giving me instructions on how to look better, you know, don't know what it's going to look like yet, but to me, that's, it's, that's what I'm interested in, like the meat and the, you know, and I do it because I, it's not that I don't trust anybody else to do it. I, you know, I've been asked, actually people have asked to be in the photographs. I don't trust, it's not about that. It's, a, you know, I don't trust, you know, I know exactly what I need to do and how to do it. It's not, you know, I've been told to stage them, like to make them look pretty. Nope, 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 nope. So I think that's, to me, it's about that action in the world, you know, pushing the public, seeing what happens, and then presenting the image and pushing it another way. So it's physical performance, but it's also kind of a, a catalyst when it lives on the internet, so. Oh, thanks. Mm. Thanks for being here <laughs> <laughs> again. <laughs> and uh, my question is just, has it ever happened now that the work has been out there so much that since you, the, in the later time, now that you've been doing it more recently, have people recognized you and, and, and in those moments and come up to you and, and made it more difficult to do the work you're doing? Um, no, and I think that also speaks to like how we, we see something, we and consume it, and then we're done with it. Because, um, I mean, I have to know metrics. I'm not tooting the horn. Like, 18 million people saw it on one, one engagement, one article. Um, 10,000 comments on Viral Nova, okay? And, but when it's done, it's done. And so people are like, you're famous. I'm like, um, a quarter and that will get me, you know, a piece of gum. I'm so grateful that, that the work has, has gotten as far as it has, but at the same time, it has to work for me. Um, like it's, um, a lot of articles are not authorized. Um, like today, getting these emails, getting these friends requests, let me Google myself, oh, you know, didn't authorize that one. So it's, it's you know, basically it's, it's about PR control too. But no, it's one guy, one time a guy recognized us. He's nice about it. But I mean, that was it. Thank you. Again, thank you so much. Right. Thank you, everyone.